I, I made this class because not a lot of people know what J2534 is. And um, not, not a lot of people know what a BMW ICOM is and how to bring everything together with the ISTA software, which is the BMW OEM programming software. All right. So I made this class with a few things in mind that I have to be able to show you guys how to prevent a massive catastrophic failure so the car is not at your shop for a week straight and the customer is yelling in your ear saying, why isn't my car done yet? And you're just, just stuck. All right, so we're going to try to avoid that with this class. Um, these are the topics we're going to cover. Um, mostly uh, what's involved with setting up uh, ISTA, um, the subscription, um, how to set up your password device, ICOM, what to look out for when programming, the prerequisites, what to look out for after programming so the car doesn't come back. And uh, I added a couple of things, including uh, vehicle orders. I'm going to go real quick through that. That's not really something you want to do. You kind of want to shy away from it if you could, because you kind of mess up a car that way <laughs> if you don't know what you're doing. So I'm going to kind of make you uh, aware of what it is and what you could do with it, just so you know, you know, so you, you know what it's about. Um, I also have some uh, extras in here. Um, a couple of things I've picked up by working at AutoLogic. A um, couple of companies that, uh, that basically allow you to uh, basically code DMEs from another used vehicle. Um, put, remove like EWSs out of E46. You know, just like weird stuff like that. Sometimes customers come in, they got race cars and they want to remove certain things or they want to put used parts in cars and usually with ISTA you can't do it and these companies allow you to just send them the, the part or even remotely program it and take out the, the control unit uh, in question. Um, at the end, just so you guys know, <laughs> there is a test at the end. Um, the test involves uh, E93. Uh, it's basically you, you replace the E93 FRM. Uh, so somebody gave you an FRM and they said program it with J2534 and ISTA. And it's basically you going through the steps of selecting what, you know, what buttons you need to press to get to ISTA. When you're in ISTA, what, you what buttons you have to press so the, the software knows uh, what module you're, you're programming. Um, and basically, you know, going through the whole process, there's certain pitfalls involved with it um, that could really screw up the car if you're not careful. And in that test, I put those pitfalls in there so you could actually see, oh, you know, maybe I should look out for this, you know. Um, and you could take that test home and actually program a FRM and successfully, you know. Um, in that process, you can move over to other vehicles also, like minis, um, E70s, uh, Rolls Royce, you know. So you could basically transfer it through different chassis. All right. Um, at the end, also, AutoLogic CIP errors. You know how sometimes people that have AutoLogics, you get like errors during CIP. They say like uh, error 517, contact AutoLogic, right? And then you got to contact us. We got to kind of tell you what's involved, send the login. I put the, the definitions of the errors in there so you could actually know, so you don't have to call. It could be something as simple as, you know, faults couldn't be cleared. You know, you don't got to call us for that, you know. You know, stuff like this. Just the point is that I'm trying to have you guys do this safely and have you save time while doing it, which means you're going to save money. So that's the whole point of the class, really. All right. And at the very end, there's some uh, abbreviations uh, for control units. And uh, so like FRMs, full wheel module, you know, stuff like that. So anything related to BMW, um, it's going to give you an idea of what the acronym is. So you could take that home and, you know, study it. Especially if you're looking at a control unit list in CIP and, you know, it'll tell you what it is through that list. All right. So J2534. I'm going to make this real simple. Basically, J2534 is a protocol that the government mandated that allows you to use one device to program 
uh, various manufacturers. So like with the BMW ICOM, you have to use that on BMW vehicles. So Rolls Royce, you know, many BMW. With this J2534 device, you can hook it up to Chevy, Mazda, BMW, everything under the sun that's J2534 compatible. That's basically all it is. This is the, the little, uh, uh, it's like a guide of how the programming gets to the car. You know, it's just BMW headquarters, internet, from the internet goes to your PC, to ISTA, to an API, which is basically a, it's basically a translator. It takes the information, the OEM information that ISTA sends, it transfers it to this API, the API translates it to something that the uh, J2534 device can interpret, and then programs the car via that protocol. Okay. All right, OSS. OSS is just uh, a set of applications that BMW made uh, so the aftermarket could use them. So at the dealership, they have ISTA also, and everything's really included in ISTA and BMW Air, which is basically an application that has wiring diagrams, part information, stuff like that. But for the aftermarket, they made this website called BMW TIS or BMW Tech Info, which includes all that information and they call it OSS, online service system. That's all it is. All right. And these are the things included. Basically everything that the dealer could see, you could see through that website. I'm also going to talk about um, ISTA D and ISTA P. All right, ISTA D, BMW calls it ISTA. All right, and ISTA P. I'm, for this class, I'm going to call it ISTA D and ISTA P, just so it's separated. You know what I'm saying? So it's very easy to understand. But just keep in mind that about a couple of weeks ago, BMW actually added programming to ISTA D for um, F, G, and I series cars. So before you used to have to do it in ISTA P programming, which is pretty you know obvious. But now they are transferring everything into ISTA D. All the legacy cars, like E-Series cars, are still in ISTA-P, okay? So that's what you have to remember. And these are the things you could do in ISTA-P, like car key memory, um, import and delete vehicle orders. Um, and also, you could do the same things in ISTA-D for F, G, and I-Series cars also. But just remember that, that ISTA-P is for E-Series cars, the later, not the, the older cars. It's the D is now for F, G, and I series cars. Because if you try to go into it's the D and try to program an E series car, you're going to get a big fat message saying, can't do it. Okay? <laughs> Before you get started, you always want to make sure you have the proper equipment. So you, there's a big misconception uh, in the AutoLogic you know, industry, people that buy the AutoLogic, that the Assist Plus could do J2534 programming. And that's not true. It did come with a J2534 device, but you have to have a separate laptop or PC to run the ISTA software. You can't run the J2534 software, aka ISTA and ISTA-P, on the AutoLogic. All right? And I put a series of specs here that allow you to go out to Best Buy or the internet and buy the proper computer so you could run ISTA trouble-free so it doesn't crash or do anything weird, you know. So uh, these are actually not even the, the specs BMW puts out. They put lower specs. And I know I've seen it. <laughs> They're not good enough. So I put this series of, uh, of specs up here so you could actually pick out a good computer that won't kill your programming, all right? Um, one point here, when you get a hard drive, if you have a 250 gigabyte hard drive of capacity, it still won't run. It has to be 250 gigabytes of free hard drive space. So if you download a video and it goes down to 249, it won't run ISTA. It'll just complain it doesn't have enough hard drive space. All right. I usually recommend about 300. Um, if you have various manufacturers you want to run on the laptop, um, I recommend 300 gigabytes uh, partitioned 
drives. So let's say you have a, uh, a gigabyte hard drive. You could partition it in three ways. So you have you know, a couple of manufacturers on there uh, without them interfering with each other, because that's the last thing you want. Like if you have like Jaguar pass through, and then you have BMW on the same one, no good. <laughs> Jaguar designed that software to like basically take over the computer and just destroy everything. <laughs> so you don't want you want everything partitioned. All right. Does everybody know what that means when you partition a drive? Like it's basically like a pizza. You know, you just slice it up. Another thing BMW changed is that you want to make sure you have Windows 10, um, which is pretty surprising because you know as everybody knows Windows 10 wasn't that good <laughs> a couple of years ago. Um, they always used Windows 7 Pro. But lately, after the big upgrade, when they changed over to ISTA D programming, Windows 10 is, that's it. You can only use Windows 10. If you try to install this on Windows 7, you'll just get weird errors. You never know why. All right? Um, and one thing to know, when you search for a PC, when you're buying it, um, x86 is a 32-bit computer, and x64 is a 64-bit computer. You want a 64-bit computer, OK, when you buy one. And Apple is not compatible. <laughs> um, this, is, this is one thing that I run into a lot. A lot of people want to know if you could program over hotspots or connect it to your phone. <laughs> it's one of those things that could work, but you don't want to do it. <laughs> you remember, the point of this class is try to make you mitigate failure. But if you do something like that, there's a high chance programming is going to fail. You're gonna lose, you need a constant connection to BMW server all the time so programming could pass properly. All right. So it is possible if you're in a jam, but I wouldn't do it. Okay. All right. this, is, this is huge. This is another thing that could kind of mess you up and leave you like for three days trying to install ISTA and it doesn't work, you know. So this is actually on my computer. Um, this is the user information. So when you're logged in to the computer with your password and everything, it tells you if you're an administrator or a regular user. If you're not an administrator, ISTA is not going to install properly. Okay? You're going to try to load up ISTA, install it, you're going to have problems. It's not going to work. It's not going to have the proper permissions. So in this book, in your, in your book there, I put the, the steps that you have to select to get to this setting to see if you're an administrator, OK? Again, to mitigate failure, not a, lot, not a lot of people think about this, but a screensaver could actually crash your car. So if you're programming for four hours, you're like, all right, I'll come back later. You leave the mouse just sitting there. Screensaver is going to come up. It's going to lock the computer. And it's going to crash the programming. OK, you're going to come back. You're not really going to know what, what happened. You're just going to move the mouse. Everything's going to turn on. And then you're going to see the thing just failed. All right, so right here, I put a way to disable the screensaver. All right. Um, on this right here, this is your resolution. Um, they call it screen uh, scaling. Um, I've noticed ISTA doesn't really look right. ISTA D doesn't really look right. Uh, it kind of cuts off the top and the bottom if you don't have the screen uh, uh, setting properly. Um, you want it under 125%. And it, usually everything fits nicely, and you could see everything. Um, if it's over 150, it still won't even run. It'll give you an error saying that the resolution is not correct. And you'll change the resolution, and, and it still won't work. It's the screen sa uh, scaling. This is another thing here, pop-up blocker. You want to disable it. Because ISTA uses a various uh, amounts of windows to start up the program. Sometimes you can't even see them. It just does it so fast. But if you have a pop-up blocker on, it'll kind of block the program. And it, you won't really know why it's not working. You'll just sit there with a you know, blank screen. So just make sure you disable the pop-up blocker. And that's how you do it there in Internet Explorer. Um, another thing, <laughs> Windows updates in Windows 10. Windows allows you to kind of turn off Windows updates for like a couple of days, but it doesn't allow you to just turn them off completely. Okay, so just watch out for this because Windows updates will turn on while you're programming. It doesn't care if it ended on that last day, 
when, when you set it, you know, a couple of days ago, I think something like 15 days, it will, it will start doing the update, and when it's done, it's gonna restart the computer automatically. So, it doesn't care if you're programming. <laughs> so, all right, Java. Java is huge. Java is huge here on, on ISTA and ISTA P. That's basically the, the background program it uses to run the software. If this isn't correct, you'll never get ISTA to load, to work, and it's the most annoying thing in the world. <laughs> Because it doesn't really give you errors, it doesn't give you anything, it just doesn't work. All right? So on this particular uh, slide here, I've noticed some guys, you know when you get kind of like security messages and you're like, okay, 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 don't show me again, don't show me again, don't worry about it, you know? That could kind of screw you over because when you run ISTA, it needs to be able to run certain scripts via Java. And if you said, don't show me again, that script will never come up and not turn on ISTA, okay? And I found out a way on how to get to Java. It's like it's, it's setting console, and you could basically go through these steps and restore the security prompts. And then you go back into, uh, you actually turn off Inter Internet Explorer, restart it, and then you'll start ISTA, and then you'll get that prompt come back. It'll, it'll keep asking you, you know, do you want to run this program? So it'll do what it's supposed to do when you do that. All right, this is how to basically run your uh, Windows updates before you install ISTA, because you want to have your Windows updates all up to date, especially because you don't want it doing it while it's programming. Um, you want your computer fully up to date before you, you do your programming, okay? And then go ahead and turn it off afterward, <laughs> okay? And that's how you do it right there. And this is huge right here. I've seen so many times that people call me and they say, they go through the process, you know, I, they did everything right. You know, they, everything's installed right. I looked through it, everything's right. And I'm like, have you uh, restarted the computer? No? Okay, let's restart it, see what happens. Restart it, two minutes later, everything works. Firewall settings, I've got to the point that it's not even worth messing around with this. Just turn it off <laughs> because half the time it's not right, it doesn't work. And, this is how you basically turn it off. These are the steps right here. If you really want it on, just turn it off while you're programming, while you're doing what you have to do, and then turn it back on when you're done. It'll save you so much grief. You know, again, you'll, you'll get weird, op, you know, weird things happening. ICOM wouldn't show up, or the password won't show up. You know, it's just weird stuff, and it won't give you an error why. So just turn it off, save you a lot of trouble. All right, this is another thing I found um, with the password device. Um, after you installed the drivers for the password device, let's say you have a Cardac Plus 2 from Jutech, and you, you, know, you installed ISTA, and you're trying to find the password device in the connection manager, so when you're gonna hook up to the car, you don't see it there, right? And you're like, all right, what's going on here? Again, no errors, nothing. It won't tell you anything. Now what I found is, there's what they call a device manager, right? I've noticed sometimes, for whatever reason, the driver for the password device doesn't install properly. And what you could do is go to this de device manager, you go down the list, and then you'll find the password device in this list here, and then you'll see like an exclamation mark next to it, or an X, or it's grayed out. And the problem with that is that that's basically the device's firmware, the software to work. And if that's not working or installed properly, the password device never gonna, it's never going to activate and show up, and it's never going to work, all right? So that's where you do that, and that's where you see if that's going on.